Well, good morning, Chapel family. I greet you this morning in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm so thankful to be with you and to be able to open God's Word with you. I love the writings of the Apostle John. I'm excited to continue in our study of this little epistle of 1 John, and I pray that our time will be profitable this morning. Would you pray with me? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Father, we thank you for all that you've done for us in Jesus Christ. And I thank you that we can celebrate uh, someone putting their faith in Christ just this week. And what a joy that is to look at that rose and be reminded of what Jesus did on the cross for each one of us. And, and what a thrill that is, Lord. Father, as we come to your word, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be our guide and our teacher, that he'd lead us into all truth, and that you'd open our hearts to your word today and help us to be doers of the word, not merely hearers. Help our lives to be changed because of your word and because of spending time in your word. And Father, I thank you that we can be in your word and that we can hold a copy of the Bible in our hands. Bless this time, we pray, and be with each one uh, in the congregation, we pray. And we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have you ever had a difficult time loving someone? And it's interesting that we celebrated our new members today. And Pastor Keith reminded us about loving one another and loving our new members and how important that is. That's the message that uh, John is going to give us in this little epistle uh, in the chapter 3 today. But there are people that will say, oh, boy, I just, you know, I love that person so much, but I, boy, I have a hard time loving that one. You know, we just do. And then I've heard this. That person is basically unlovable. Have you ever heard that? Maybe you've said it. <laughs> but in God's eyes, it's different. You see, God sees us um, as his creation, those that he has created. And for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And we know that we are loved by God. But we're going to take a closer look at this command that John gives us to love one another. And uh, we're going to look at some possible reasons why that's challenging in our world today. But if you have a Bible, turn with me please to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. You'll go a little bit just past 2 Peter. And if you get to Jude, you've gone too far. If you get to Revelation, you've gone way too far. And if you're, if you're in the maps, you really need to turn back soon. In our last time together, I want to remind you, we asked the question, what are you practicing? Are you practicing sin? Are you practicing lawlessness? And John said, if you're doing that, you're a child of the devil. Or are you practicing righteousness and if you've put your faith in Jesus Christ we've been declared righteous and we need to be practicing righteousness we need to be practicing living a holy life if we say that we are a Christian and that we have put our faith in Jesus Christ then we must also have love for one another we must love our brothers. Listen to what Jesus said in the Gospel of John, chapter 13. This is um, in the upper room discourse. He has just finished getting on his knees and washing the feet of his disciples. One of the most amazing stories in all of Scripture. And he's getting ready to go to the cross. So he's leaving them with words that he wants to imprint on their hearts. And he says this in John 13, verses 34 and 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you. That you also love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The mark of a true Christian is loving one another. That's what Jesus said. And they will know that you are my disciples. They will know that you believe in me if you love one another. So if you're in 1 John, our story begins in verse 11. 
I'm going to read verse 11 through verse 18, and then we'll look at it closer. For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of the evil one and slew his brother, and for that what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or deed, uh, word, excuse me, with word or with tongue, but in deed and in truth. I want to begin by reading you a quote. In 1970, noted evangelist and author Francis Schaeffer, Francis Schaeffer introduced his book, The Mark of a Christian, with these words. Through the centuries, men have displayed many different symbols to show that they are Christians. They have worn masks in the lapels of their coats, they've hung chains around their necks, even had special haircuts. Of course, there's nothing wrong with any of these if one feels it is his calling. But there's a much better sign, a mark that has not been thought up just as a matter of expediency for use on some special occasion or in some specific era. It is a universal mark that is to last through all the ages of the church until Jesus comes back. What is this mark? At the close of his ministry, Jesus looks forward to his death on the cross, the open tomb, and the ascension. Knowing that he's about to leave, Jesus prepares his disciples for what is to come. It is here that he makes clear what will be the distinguishing mark of the Christian. Little children, yet a little while I'm with you, ye shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whether I go, ye cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men shall know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. These are the verses that I quoted not too long ago. This is the mark that every Christian must bear, that we love one another. Another great verse is John 15, verse 12. This is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. You see, Jesus is the example. He is the model. He is the reason that we can love one another. Now let's take a closer look at verse 11. For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning that we should love one another. The message we've heard from the beginning, it goes back really to ancient times. And we find this command all the way back in the Old Testament, all the way back in the book of Leviticus. Leviticus 19, verse 18. You shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. All the way back in Leviticus. And there are numerous calls to love one another in the New Testament, but Jesus gives us the foundation for this in the Gospels. Luke 10, verse 27, he begins by quoting quoting Deuteronomy 6, verse 5. He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And then he quotes the Leviticus 19 passage we just read, and your neighbor as yourself. What Jesus did here in the Gospel of Luke is he sums up the entire Ten Commandments. And if you look at the Ten Commandments, if you study the Ten Commandments, you'll see that they're really divided up into two parts. There are those that are vertical, that deal with our love for God and our relationship with God. There are those that deal with our love for our neighbor or relationship with our neighbor. And he sums them up in two commandments. The first one is that you love God with everything you have. 
with your whole being. The second one is you love your neighbor as yourself. But when he says we're to love our neighbors, and most people talk about loving our neighbors, but he has a little caveat there. As yourself. As yourself. Meaning that if we're going to truly love one another, we've got to love ourselves. And this is, I believe, a challenge in our world today. And I think one of the stumbling blocks that we have in truly loving one another is we don't really love ourselves. You know, the world around us the world is selfish and they pretend to love only themselves and they're self-absorbed but you see they can't really love themselves because they don't have a love for Jesus Christ and so it's it's a false love if you will but we don't have a good model do we for loving one another from the world but here's some of the challenges and let me just name a few and just see if you can relate number one you look in the mirror you get up and you look in there and you say, hmm, ooh, I don't like that. Ooh, I don't like that. Oh, is one eyebrow taller than the other one? I mean, you go on and on. But we don't like what we see. But, you know, we're sinners. Our bodies are affected by sin. They're not going to be perfect. Number two, nobody likes me, the little boy says when he comes home from school. Don't have any friends. Nobody likes me. An adult will say, nobody loves me. Nobody loves me. Or number three, I've been humbled and just put down too many times. I, you know, my parents, uh, I have a, a set of parents that have never told me one time they love me. They've never put their arms around me, embraced me. We've all met people that have gone through that. Some of you have gone through that. Some of you have spent your whole childhood trying to please a parent, but sometimes it just doesn't happen. Then we go to school, and our teachers tell us how short-sighted we are and how, boy, can't you figure that out? Can't you do that problem? You are so inadequate. And then we live through that, and then we, we go out in the sports uh, field, and our coaches say, Finley, can't you run faster than that, you know? Finley, can't you catch that ball? You know, I could tell you a million stories about, uh, you know, the athletic field and being humbled by coaches. But I'm going to share one story because I've never forgotten this story. It happened in my freshman year in college. When, at University of Oregon, I was a freshman. I was a typical freshman. I was struggling to find my way. <laughs> Discipline was a difficult thing for me. And I can remember in my dorm room, getting ready to go to bed and, and I look around and I think mom's not here you know nobody's here to tell me to go to bed nobody's here to tell me to brush my teeth nobody's here to tell me to do my homework and so I slept in for a few classes that first semester and I struggled but I went to, I was a music major I was a pre-med major but I was majoring in music at the time went to my voice lesson the this teacher was an older woman who had had a stellar career in opera I mean she was really gifted really talented but I thought she's older and I thought I haven't practiced this song very much and I'm I think I'm going to just get it by her and just see if I can just sing through it and we can go on so she starts playing and I start singing it's in a foreign language and I'm singing away and I'm missing words here and there and I'm missing a few notes and just not sounding my best but I was I was faking it you know I tried to just tried to fake her out really and she plays and I'm singing and I'll never forget she, we, she gets to the end of the song and she just looks right at me and, I, and I'm and I'm kind of smiling because I'm thinking okay we're she's going to make some comment we're going on on and she said this she said Jeff I wish the composer of that song is, would still be alive so you could apologize to him for what, you, for what you just did to his song. I've never forgotten that. Now, that was a humbling experience, and it certainly could have damaged my little self-esteem. But I recovered from it, and I fortunately got some discipline in my life, and I, I practiced more from after that and did better. And I wasn't scarred because I knew I was wrong. 
I mean, I, I knew that I didn't work very hard. But there are things that, that happen. And I want to just share a sad story. When I was in junior high, I was running track. And I don't look like a runner, but I didn't look like one back then either. <clears throat> I was running track. And there was a guy from a neighboring school. He was a top athlete. He was the best in everything. And he was a sprinter. He ran the 100-yard dash. And I mean, he beat everybody by lengths. And his father, I'll never forget, his father was sitting right in the front row of the bleachers just watching him. And when he finished, I'm thinking, boy, a big embrace from dad. You won the race. And he walks over and he gets in his son's face and he tells him, you should have run harder. You could have won by more. You've got to reach your full potential. And throughout the year, we had track meets with that same school and I'd watch him run and watch the dad do the same thing. In high school, he was the star quarterback. He was just the best. But his father never gave up. And I read in the paper that before he finished his senior year, he'd killed himself because he'd been beaten down too much. And then the fourth thing is, some people say our life has no value because we forget to see ourselves in Christ and we don't think we have value and we don't think we have purpose. And it's no wonder then that we have a problem loving one another because we just have such a hard time loving ourselves. So what do we do? Well, you go to the Bible and you start in Genesis. Genesis 1 verse 27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. That separates us from every living creature. We've been created in God's image. What a blessing. And that's a whole other sermon for well what that means. <clears throat> but let me tell you, we can get our worth, our value from the fact that we know we've been created in God's image. I had a seminary professor once that said within every human being, God put a spark, he called it a spark of the divine. That means within each one of us, he put a desire to know God. Now because of sin and because of other things and because of the influences of the devil and influences of the world, sometimes people go astray. They, they never put their faith in Jesus Christ because they get distracted and waylaid by, and that spark of the divine, that, that desire to know God gets covered by so many other things. But secondly, our value and our worth comes from the fact that we know that God loves us. And he loves us so much that he sent Jesus Christ to die for us, for our sins. Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love toward us that in while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. God loves you. And we need to be reminded of that. I found an online Bible study and I was very interested in what they had to say. And they gave seven ways in which God loves us. And I just wanna remind you, I'm gonna go through these quickly. And there's a verse, if you wanna write down the verse, you can look it up later. But number one, God loves us with an atoning love. And it comes from John 3:16. And it's so very important to understand that he loves us in Christ, that he sent Christ to be our propitiation on the cross. Number two, God loves us with a calling love. He called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's 1 Peter 2, verse 9. 1 Peter 2, verse 9. Number three, God loves us with a redeeming love. He sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as an offering for sin. And um, we who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. He, he fulfilled the law in Christ in dying for us with a redeeming love. That's Romans 8, 3 and 4. Number four, God loves us with a justifying love. Being justified is a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. That's Romans 3, 23 to 25, a justifying love. Number five, God loves us with an adopting love. 
In the Gospel of John, he says, as to a many has received him, to them he gave the right to become a child of God. We are adopted into his family. Can you get over that? We are a part of God's family. That's John 1.12. Number six, God loves us with a sanctifying love. That's Hebrews 10.10. 10. We're sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus once for all. And number seven, God loves us with a glorifying love. We know that when he appears, we'll be like him because we will see him just as he is. We're going to be glorified when Christ returns and it's going to be a wonderful thing, and we're going to see him just as he is, and it's going to be an amazing thing. That's First John, um, First John three, one verse two, and I'll just read that very first verse. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. What a great opportunity! And then Philippians one verse six. I love this one. For I'm confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. He is working on us just like a sculptor just chips away at the ice until that sculptor becomes something beautiful. God is chipping away at you and me. And he's going to keep doing it until we meet him. So if you are feeling low, if you're feeling like you don't have a lot of self-worth, if you've been beaten down, if you've never had parents or maybe anybody that's told you to love you, remember that you've been created in God's image. And remember how much God loves you. And those are just, you know, seven things, but the Bible is full. Be in your Bible and be reminded every single day how much God loves you. And because of that great love, we can then love one another. Look at verse 12. He gives some negative examples. Cain was the evil one. He slew his brother. <laughs> Here's the first opportunity for brothers to love one another. I mean, this is the very beginning of the Bible. But you see, sin just happened in chapter 3. And the result is murder. Murder in chapter 4. Cain outwardly worshipped God just like his brother. He made an offering. But inwardly, he was of the devil. And he was of what they call the evil one. But we're told in Hebrews 11 verse 4 that Abel's offering was better by faith Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous God testifying about his gifts and through faith though he is dead he still speaks Abel's example still speaks Cain was unrighteous but he hated Abel because he was righteous if you look at verse 12 again Cain was of the evil one the evil one is from the Greek uh, word paneros and listen to this it means to be determined aggressive evil that opposes all that is good now doesn't that describe the devil he opposes not just good in general he opposes all that is good there is no good in him he opposes it all and that's how Cain is described then John describes in verse 13 that we shouldn't be surprised that the world hates us. And that's kind of a sobering thought. But Jesus said it's going to happen because it happened to me too. John 15 verse 18, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. Jesus said expect it. It's going to happen because it happened to me. We must keep our eyes fixed on Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith. Don't spend too much time in front of that mirror looking at yourself. <laughs> Gaze at Jesus Christ and merely glance at yourself to make sure your hair is in place or whatever. But gaze at Christ. That's what we're to do. Verse 14. This one reminds me so much of John's gospel. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death into life. If you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, you've passed from death into life. And by the way, if you're here today and you don't know Christ, 
Let me plead with you. Put your faith alone in Christ alone. There's no more important thing you can do in this life than to put your faith in Christ. It changes everything. And it is the first step, really, not only for loving God through Christ, but for loving one another. And that's so important. What a wonderful confirmation that we can know that we can be saved. And John gives that to us. Verse 15 is a reminder, a sobering, another negative example of Jesus amplifying the, the Ten Commandments. He talks about everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. Now, one of the things I love about the New Testament and Jesus' ministry is he clarifies the Old Testament. He gives us an amplification, if you will. This is Matthew 5, verses 21 and 22. And he's talking about the fifth commandment, thou shalt not murder. You have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not commit murder, and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, <laughs> shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. You see, Jesus is saying here, I look into your heart. It's what goes on your heart that matters. Yes, you may not physically kill someone. You may not physically murder your brother. But if you're angry with him, you've basically killed him in your heart. Hatred is the ultimate extent of anger. But it's a hard issue, and God looks at our heart. Now remember, I want to remind you, a murderer can be forgiven. A murderer can confess that sin and put his faith in Jesus Christ. That's possible. But for those that reject Christ and continually harbor hatred in their heart towards their brother will not inherit, will not inherit eternal life. And I went to the final chapter of the Bible and this is Jesus really summing it all up in Revelation 22. That's the last chapter of the Bible, by the way, verses 14 and 15. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter by the gates into the city outside of the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral persons and the murderers and the murderers and the idolaters, and everyone who loves practicing lying. This is some of Jesus' final words. It's like a final reminder of who is going to be left out of heaven. Now, verse 16 is a wonderful example. We know love by this, that he laid down, meaning Jesus laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. What a great verse. And he said that, Jesus said in, in John 10, verse 15, even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, I lay my da life down for the sheep. That's what Jesus did. He demonstrated his love for us by laying his life down, sacrificing himself on the cross for you and me. And it's the kind of love that we must have for one another let's look at the last two verses verse 17 but whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him how does the love of God abide in him how can we say that we love God and we ignore the needs of our neighbor we ignore the needs of our brethren little children verse 18 little children let us not love with word or with tongue but in deed and in truth we have all heard this, actions speak louder than words. That's right. You can go to your neighbor and say, oh, I love you. I love that you're living next door to me. Or call your brother up on the phone. I love you. You're part of our family. But if you never show it, it just doesn't ring clear. Galatians 6, verse 10. So then while we have opportunity, think of that. While we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. We don't know what tomorrow may bring. If you're going to call a friend, a neighbor, if you're going to write them a note, 
If you're going to do something for them, do it today. Because you don't know if you have tomorrow. While we have opportunity. So, in closing, we've already looked at how we can love ourselves and, and how we can demonstrate love for one another. And I want to remind you of just a couple things. First of all, I want to remind you of the mission statement. You just heard it from pastor today. This is the mission statement for the, past, the chapel of Christian faith. Loving people into a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. Couldn't be more perfect for the message today because that's John's message. We've got to love one another. We've got to love people into a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. So how do we love others? Well, uh, let me give you a few ways. First of all, we can meet their physical needs. Verse 17, we can give them food, clothing, shelter, gas for their car, or a loaf of banana bread. I just threw that one in because that's one of my favorites. And some of you have done that. And when you give me a loaf of banana bread or even zucchini bread or even pumpkin bread, I know that you love me. <laughs> then number two, we can meet their emotional needs. And this is important. We can call them on the phone. We can write a card. We can go visit or we'll simply just give them a hug. And you know, some of these things you can do if you're homebound. Maybe you can't get around. You don't drive too much. And that's okay. Some of these things you can do right in the comfort of your own home. It just takes effort. And then thirdly, we meet their spiritual need. You share your testimony. You share Christ. And you love them into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And what a great opportunity that is. You know, Paul shared his testimony five times, at least, in the book of Acts. And he used a model, and I'll share this model, because some of you think, well, I just don't know the Bible well enough to share my faith, or, I, or I might, they might ask me a question I don't know. It's okay. You certainly know John 3.16. John 3.16 by itself is sufficient enough to bring anyone to Jesus Christ. But you can just share your testimony. That's what Paul did first part is what was your life like before Christ that's what Paul shared I was a persecutor of the church I went after Christians I brought them to prison and I persecuted them I was a hater of the church then secondly how did you come to Christ did someone introduce you to Christ what was your experience and then he of course shared the road to Damascus I met Jesus through a blinding light took me to the ground took everybody with him to the ground but I met Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus and then thirdly what is your life like now what's your life like now that you know Christ that you love him serve him see you can just share your own testimony we all have a testimony and you just share that and pray that the Holy Spirit would do a mighty work in the person you're sharing it with but we can love them into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ you pray with me father this chapter is such a, a reminder that we need to love christ that we need to love others into a personal relationship with him help us to do that lord help us to fulfill all that you've called us to do thank you for your great love thank you for your transforming love that has transformed us and brought us from death into life and we give you the praise, Lord, for all things in Jesus' name. Amen.